All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Welcome to this month's Tennessee Healthcare Financial Management Association's webinar. Uh, I'm Brad Adams. I am the web chair uh, this year for the Tennessee chapter, and I have got the pleasure of introducing Chris Wilson. Uh, Chris is from Pershing Yokely and Associates Kansas City office. Um, Chris is an attorney, and he works with healthcare organizations. Um, helping to address strategic issues involving the healthcare market. He has a unique combination of consulting and legal experience um, and helps design and implement clinical, clinical integration initiatives, public policy projects, mergers and acquisitions, and governance strategies. Um, he also provides advisory services in healthcare IT and best practices uh, related to evidence-based medicine. Um, so thank you, Chris, for being with us this morning, and uh, I'll let you get on with uh, ACOs. Well, thank you, Brad. I appreciate the chance to, to be here with the Tennessee HFMA chapter, and uh, thank you and Kelly for the invite, and, and excited to, to spend a little time over lunch here with you all uh, talking about everyone's favorite topic, the accountable care organization. Uh, I suppose the, the, the good news out of the gate is that uh, I'm not here to talk about charge masters or any articles in Time Magazine, so I know that's probably welcome news to the HFMA folks, but uh, I, I, the, the marching orders uh, that, that I've received uh, for the interest of the group is uh, really kind of give some, some basic uh, high-level understanding on what is important about ACOs from a uh, development standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from an operational standpoint that could allow this group to get some context as they uh, begin discussions uh, uh, about ACOs in their own enterprises. Um, now, I'm sure that folks on the line, just knowing the market there in Tennessee, some uh, may be uh, well down the road involved in an ACO, some may be in the middle of a development of an ACO, and, and some might be still figuring out what the acronym uh, might stand for. So um, I, I would gather there's a, a wide-ranging knowledge base here from the outset, but uh, I'll try to keep it fairly high level, and then at the end we can uh, open up for questions and maybe drill down on some specifics as as necessary. Um, you know, you know, today I, I think we'll do a couple things. Uh, we'll give a, a, a brief background and some context about where the uh, ACO falls in, in this overall health reform spectrum. Uh, then we'll start talking about uh, some of the basic economics of ACOs and, and shared savings models of, of uh, uh, healthcare payment systems. Uh, then I think we'll talk about some kind of basic statistics of how many ACOs are out there, what they're looking like, uh, what some of the market uh, from a regional market standpoint looks like as well. Uh, then we'll, we'll talk briefly about the Medicare ACO program um, and, and keep that fairly high level because that's probably its own presentation, hour-long presentation in and of itself. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about sort of a, an alternative or a complement to the, the accountable care organization. That's the clinically integrated networks that are uh, being developed more and more frequently, and we see a lot more of those uh, out in the market right now. So if you think about uh, kind of the healthcare delivery system uh, as a whole, and these are some fairly high-level conceptual slides here, but uh, you know, today we all uh, hear that we operate in a siloed environment where the patient is uh, uh, taking trips to different providers that are under different structures, and uh, there's a lack of coordination of care among those different entities, and that those siloed structures are often uh, maximizing the volume of billable encounters at each location. So, uh, whereas the uh, linear use of uh, healthcare services isn't necessarily always tied to acuity, where we have things like patients going directly to a specialist or the ED for things that might not necessitate that level of care. Now, what we're seeing more and more is a shift towards uh, a, a different type of model of care, where we're treating the patient as a whole, as a person, uh, rather than a patient that's just a visitor at a single location in the site on the care continuum. And it's, uh, it's, it's an approach to care where the patient is uh, uh, your responsibility, regardless of sort of where they fall in the 
uh, care continuum. And just as sort of some context here, if you look at that uh, concentric circle chart on the right, uh, I think it's good to just to sort of have a baseline definition of what an ACO really is. Uh, and because a lot of people define it different ways, and the definition I use, I like to use is sort of three pronged. And one, it's, an ACO is an organization that's uh, made up of healthcare providers that uh, that one take responsibility for a defined patient population. Two, that they coordinate care across settings. And three, that they are jointly accountable for quality and cost. And I think that's just sort of a good baseline definition to use when you start to think about these things. Because what you'll often find is that because there's so many buzzwords and new care models out there in this health reform environment, that folks will often uh, confuse the ACO approach with something like a medical home approach. A good way to distinguish those two, I've found, is that the ACO is sort of the layer between the healthcare delivery system and the rest of the world, sort of an upward facing layer uh, you know, that interacts with payers and employers and the government. Whereas something like a medical home would be a layer or a model that's in between the uh, care providers uh, and the actual patients or people that they're treating. Another good uh, distinguishing factor about ACOs to sort of further be able to define them is that there are different types of ACOs based on the types of organizations that are paying the ACO. Uh, and, and those generally fall into two buckets, public ACOs, so Medicare and Medicaid, primarily Medicare through the Shared Savings Program, and private ACOs that are based on private payer uh, reimbursement or dollars that would be from commercial payers. Uh, those can also include large employers. Um, and uh, one approach that a lot of hospital systems are fond of right now is using their self-insured population as the patient population for the ACO. If you think about this evolution of how healthcare payment is progressing right now, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a continuum that we're starting to see take shape, that we're moving from our current environment of fee-for-service uh, focused uh, healthcare delivery and payment uh, to one that would grow along a continuum to uh, something that would resemble partial capitation or global payment. And, and one distinguishing factor about progressing along that continuum on this slide from left to right is that you're increasing provider risk as you move from the left side of the slide to the, life, or the right side of the spectrum. When I use that word risk in this context, it's, it's not necessarily uh, you know, the kind of the business risk that we are, are, are familiar with uh, from just operating healthcare businesses. It's more of that actuarial insurance style risk where providers or the entity bearing the risk would be uh, more responsible for say the total cost of care uh, or the outlays devoted to healthcare. Uh, costs for a certain population. Just to put some some more meat on the bones of, of this uh, spectrum here, you can kind of think about the way that we approach reimbursement from one that you know historically has been more reactive to where you have sort of a visitor, patient is more of a visitor at your current care location uh, that then uh, presents at that location when they are symptomatic or the needs are more acute, uh, more of a unit-based or, or you know, fee schedule-based uh, style of payment. Now we're starting to move more into one that's a bit more focused where uh, it's that we're focusing on what that patient receives from more of a healthcare system as a whole based on an episode of care, whether that's uh, you know, a procedural episode or a, more of a medical style episode. And we're, we're, we're learning how to best deliver care that's high quality and low cost for that particular episode or condition. And you'll see more of the shift of risk come to providers as they enter into these types of uh, uh, focused uh, care delivery. And then eventually what uh, we're, we're moving to is more of a predictive style of care where uh, we need to anticipate uh, what presenting conditions and anticipate you know, volumes of, of individuals that will be uh, providing, uh, that will require care providing, uh, care from our providers, and 
and how to manage the well-being of that population both in and outside uh, of the healthcare delivery system. And in that type of arrangement, you're pushing more and more risk onto the provider community. And across, again, back up to the top of the slide, that spectrum from left to right, shared savings is sort of the category that most accurately captures where the accountable care organization currently lies. So we're about a quarter uh, or so down this right now with something like an ACO. You know, we've talked for a few years now about health reform and value-based purchasing and value-based payment, that it's coming, that it'll be here soon. Well, it's, it's pretty clear right now that it's actually here. Um, it's no longer something we can talk about coming soon. You know, post a uh, Affordable Care Act, post Supreme Court decision, post uh, re-election of President Obama, and, and then that coupled with what is some significant activity with the commercial payers in the private markets right now, uh, you really are seeing more of a value-based approach to care delivery right now uh, with current payer contracts and current uh, federal government and state government initiatives. As we shift over from that fee-for-service style model to more of a value-based payment, we're seeing, uh, you know, incorporation of quality style metrics or quality incentive structure within a lot of that fee-for-service world. So. Uh, you know, we, we like to describe it as being quality per click. So you're still providing care in a fee-for-service type role, but there's some incentive or bonus or bump uh, based on the quality of the care that's received. And then where this goes eventually is more of a quality-based uh, uh, program where the outcome of the care determines the reimbursement. And we're concerned about more of the whole system of care that's being improved. And, how care is coordinated among different participants in the system. So right now, uh, it's sort of a bit of a messy middle uh, where uh, you have a foot in two different canoes and you have things like ACOs being proposed and adopted in different markets. And um, it's important to uh, think about this as more of an if than a when uh, at this point. So it's not if we're going to shift to more value-based payments of care or more care coordination models or more population health management style programs, it's more a matter of when uh, that, that, those, uh, that those programs will start to take effect. And, and it's important because when uh, timing is very important in these things because when markets move, as you all know, you know markets can often move very quickly and overnight in some cases, uh, if, whether that's a new uh, health system M&A activity or whether that's uh, some activity by a, a commercial payer from a contracting standpoint, um, it's important for providers to be prepared to make that move uh, as, as the market adapts around it. So now I want to turn to a little bit of the basic economics of the accountable care model, um, just to give you all a sense of, of what we see out there and what some of the data has shown so far. I think, again, as we mentioned on the previous slide, the accountable care organizations and accountable care models are really a transitional model to go from that volume-based style of um, payment and delivery uh, uh, health care to a more uh, value-based style. And when you look at uh, what folks are concerned about as they make that transition uh, in preparing uh, to form an ACO or in the early stages of ACO formation, as they make those transitions, uh, you can categorize them two ways, I think. One is creating accountable care skills, and one is creating the scale necessary to succeed uh, under an accountable care type structure. From a skill set standpoint, uh, you're often looking at things like care coordination, um, making sure that you can uh, adequately manage the patient's care across different uh, locations on the continuum. You're also uh, concerned that you have all the providers that are within that structure aligned from a financial and a clinical standpoint so that there's some clinical and financial integration so folks are incentivized uh, to perform care uh, in the best way. You're also going to see folks that uh, invest uh, fairly heavily in healthcare IT infrastructure. Uh, there's some estimates out there that healthcare IT uh, uh, startup costs for accountable care organizations often uh, could be in the seven figures fairly quickly. 
and, and there's also a skill set I describe more of the mindset, and that's and that's really when you're you're getting more focused on managing the population of health. It's just a different way of thinking about delivering care that we're not accustomed to. On the scale side of things, uh, it's important for accountable care organizations to have uh, a, a decent patient population uh, over which to spread some of that actuarial risk. And, and you'll see in the Medicare program that's a 5,000 patient threshold, but uh, some private payers have lower thresholds than that. Um, and, and so it can depend on, on sort of the type of contract that you're working with. Mm -hmm. But the other reason is that it's important to have access to capital. So the larger scale organizations uh, often have, uh, you know, better credit or more access to capital. Um, they can help defray some of those uh, ACO startup costs as well. And that's not always uh, a merger and acquisition type uh, partnership. Uh, we see a lot of joint ventures, uh, a lot of network type uh, affiliation agreements, and, and other sort of nuanced affiliation options uh, in development of ACOs. Like I said, ACO economics is a lot about shifting of risk. So it's shifting of risk to, from uh, the payer community to the provider community. And at some point, we're going to start to see that line blur. Uh, and in, there are, in some of these ACO type models, it, it's difficult to tell where the payer stops and where the provider begins. Um, but what uh, I think is, is uh, notable is that, that ACO risk really is about the total fee-for-service types of payment that that patient population is incurring, and then you, you, you net that against a benchmark, okay? And so we'll talk more about how benchmarks are set here in a second, but the cost of care against the benchmark uh, and then the, any savings that is created between those two, the delta between those two items, is that's the opportunity and the risk for an ACO uh, if you go above. Uh, what that benchmark might be. Now compare that to, you know, your, what you might be more familiar with, with an HMO style risk where a provider is receiving a capitated payment and they would be responsible for the provider's costs uh, limited to that provider, not necessarily the total payments or total costs that those patients are incurring across the entire healthcare system. And I'll You'll, you'll hear me emphasize total cost of care several times here uh, in these slides. So some more important uh, items here on total cost of care. And, and again, these are just sort of generic accountable care concepts, and some of them are very present in the Medicare program. Some of them are present in commercial payer programs. But uh, generally, you're going to have some type of total fee-for-service payments that will determine whether or not you are able to get shared savings from the payer. And sometimes you'll see this described in a private payer contract as total cost of care or TCC. And I just wanted to read you the definition of one from a, a yes, private either. or commercial payer contract that I've uh, been exposed to recently of their definition of the total cost of care uh, for determining shared savings payments to the provider. And that's this. Uh, it's the sum of the payer's allowable cost of all covered services for all attributed members, e.g. inpatient, outpatient, professional, ancillary services, and pharmacy claims received in the prior calendar year, regardless of where those services were rendered and inclusive of member liability. So again, it's not just the cost of care that your particular provider uh, has uh, delivered to that patient. It's the cost of care that that patient has uh, required from a more of a global perspective. So it's all providers, not just your provider and not just the ACO participant. Now, it's often expressed as a per member, per month style fee in the commercial contract. Um, sometimes you'll see caps on that total cost of care amount to limit some of the risk from the provider side of things. You'll also see that total cost of care number use uh, a risk adjustment figure uh, to, to take into account some of the specific risks of a particular patient population that providers serve. So those are just some of the nuances that you'll see on how that 
uh, total cost of care or total fee for service payment number is developed. Uh, and then turn to the benchmark, and that benchmark is often it's it's almost always set in advance, um, and it targets the spend for those same services or population over the time period, often a year. Uh, you're often talking about an annual uh, uh, an annual reconciliation on these types of agreements. Uh, the benchmark is uh, obviously a big deal because that determines the amount of opportunity the ACO uh, has. Uh, you'll see a lot of emphasis uh, on how that benchmark is set from the outset. Medicare, for ex uh, example, would set that benchmark and adjust it each year based on uh, growth in, in healthcare costs through a very complicated formula. You'll have some commercial payers that will push that uh, the benchmark for uh, year two would equal the total cost of care for year one, so you have to continually improve each year, uh, which could be a, a very, uh, you know, there's a, a limited or diminishing return uh, issue there if, if your benchmark is rebased annually. And so it's important to, to start to think about how the benchmark or the budget for this care that you're uh, being account held accountable for is set. Just as an example, um, uh, one commercial payer contract that, that I had in front of me recently had the uh, shared savings opportunity for any delta, any difference, any savings created between the total, between the benchmark and the total cost of care as 50% going to the hospital with the opportunity for an extra 10% to go to the hospital if certain quality metrics were met and then 40% going to the payer. As I mentioned, there's uh, some uh, typically some performance standards or quality standards involved in, in accountable care uh, contracts or arrangements. Um, these are often uh, quality metrics that you're very familiar with. The, the Medicare program quality metrics you would have been exposed to in various uh, settings before, whether that's through uh, you know, hospital compare core measures or uh, meaningful use or PQRS on the physician side, uh, they, they'll look fairly uh, familiar to you. Uh, you'll often see uh, the commercial payer community uh, piggyback on those. Uh, one uh, commercial payer contract that I have uh, here has those uh, performance standards uh, divided up based 40% uh, weighted to meeting evidence-based clinical care uh, guidelines or targets such as breast cancer screenings, colorectal cancer, uh, cancer screenings, uh, uh, diabetes testing, um, and then a 30% weight to care coordination, uh, which would involve things like preventing uh, avoidable uh, readmissions or emergency or, uh, ER visits as well. And then importantly and kind of uniquely, 30% uh, uh, weighted on patient experience. So just like you have your HCAP scores currently or uh, for the uh, hospital value-based purchasing initiative by Medicare, uh, you'll see uh, commercial payers use uh, a patient experience measure as well or survey measure as well uh, in how they uh, judge performance uh, by the ACO. And sometimes to get even access to uh, shared savings payments for the providers, you'll have to meet certain thresholds on performance. Uh, with the ACO as uh, quality measures. One important uh, uh, classification of ACO type contracts or arrangements at this point is they can be one-sided or two-sided. And basically it's just a matter of downside uh, risk for the provider that's involved. In a one-sided model, if your cost or your total cost of care exceed the benchmark, the ACO is not liable for that amount that it exceeds the benchmark by. Under a two-sided model, uh, the ACO would be liable if the cost exceeds the benchmark. And as you might imagine, in a two-sided model from a risk-reward standpoint, you're often, if you put yourself at risk for cost exceeding the benchmark, you should expect to see a higher percent of shared savings available uh, for the provider that, that uh, would commit to put some of that themselves at risk uh, for higher cost of care. Just from a, a 
more global or policy standpoint, it, you get the sense from reading commentary from CMS and some of the uh, uh, commercial uh, payers out there that the, uh, the opportunity for one-sided models seems to be closing pretty quickly. Um, I would uh, anticipate that within the next you know, two or three years that Medicare would not offer uh, the one-sided model as readily or as easily as it had in this first round of uh, the shared savings program, the Medicare ACOs. So just something to keep in mind as we start to pursue uh, development of the ACO or, or uh, consider development of an ACO. So some of the, as you start to think about or have engaged in negotiations on these or start to engage in renegotiations on an ACO or shared savings type contract, some of the key terms uh, to keep in mind. Uh, one, the parties to the contract. So is it an ACO separate entity? a sub of a health system, uh, a joint venture uh, type uh, entity uh, between a hospital and a physician group or multiple physician groups, uh, or is it the health system itself? Uh, there's, there's implications to who is the contracting entity, who would be on the hook, or who could receive the revenue uh, from a shared savings uh, contract. The population that's at play is also clearly important. Um, how that population is attributed, is it attributed by primary care physician, which seems to be the most common way, and how uh, Medicare is basing its attribution of the population. Uh, is it based on historical data? How do you see that uh, patient population shifting over the course and the term of that contract? Uh, and also you'll uh, want to consider how the, uh, uh, the, the general health of that patient population. Uh, some uh, have said that that could be uh, a potential uh, you know, negative if you have a less healthy or more expensive population. Others would view uh, a expensive population as opportunity under a shared savings contract because you would have a higher benchmark uh, based on historical uh, performance or historical costs of that population. And if you are confident in your systems and your coordination of care, you would have more uh, opportunity for shared savings as you drive those costs down. Obviously, how that total cost of care gets set is important, whether it's risk adjusted, whether it gets uh, reset every year, rebased every year. Uh, quality metrics, again, you'll want to make sure that those are something that you have some control over, uh, that you can influence and impact. Uh, you'll also want to try to leverage your efforts for reporting quality metrics in other areas, whether that's through Medicare programs or uh, through private payer or state-based programs. Also, uh, the performance standards, a bit more of a qualitative function, but are there uh, requirements for uh, as far as, you know, quality committee staffing or uh, meeting certain uh, performance on patient satisfaction or quality metrics uh, and, and what those thresholds might be and whether they get reset annually or not. And then, of course, the, at the end of the day, what percentage of shared savings might be open to or might be uh, available uh, based on your performance. So just from an operational standpoint, um, here's kind of the general uh, stepwise process that you go through in a shared savings program of how uh, the, the ACO operates and then distributes money uh, for, for its uh, participants. First, providers generally continue to bill just as they normally have on a fee-for-service basis. Uh, they're going to track quality measures that they normally have in, in their regular uh, operations or historical operations. Then, generally annually, you're going to uh, calculate the payer's actual total, co total cost of care so that, again, the total cost incurred by that patient population for all healthcare providers. It's almost always for all healthcare providers in all care settings. Then you'll compare that actual cost of care to your benchmark and, and whatever that savings number is, if it's 50% or 60%, um, the share of that percentage of savings would be paid to the ACO. Then that ACO turns around and would distribute that savings according to how it's set up to its ACO owners or participants or physician members or whatever the case may be. Uh, and then, uh, as we talked about, uh, how that benchmark is set for the next year is important. And then uh, 
you're often going and repeating the process again. Now that we've talked about some of the sort of basics of how ACOs operate from an economic and a performance standpoint, I think it's good to take a look at what's really out there right now as far as ACOs in the market. This is a map uh, here from a uh, recent health affairs piece, the journal Health Affairs, that is uh, by a group that has explored both Medicare or Medicaid public ACOs and also ACOs set up uh, by commercial payers or employers uh, and, and other folks on the private side of things. And, and what you can see here is that um, uh, you've got a lot of ACOs right now and, and the total number that they've been able to collect uh, across the country right now is 428, both public and private ACOs. Uh, you'll see here in a bit, we'll talk about Medicare ACOs make up uh, just over half of that amount. But uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of activity, just as much activity on the private side of things as you're on the public side. Uh, and you'll see a bit of a, a gap uh, in the more rural areas of the country. CMS has made it a point to incentivize uh, rural ACOs, smaller and rural ACOs, through a program they call the Advanced Payment Model, which basically subsidizes some of the startup costs and uh, some of the operating uh, costs of the ACO through some initial flat fee and per uh, beneficiary payments. And those, uh, those uh, payments then would have to be repaid based on savings that the ACO would generate but you're seeing them try to incentivize uh, a lot of uh, uh, ACO development in those states here that uh, aren't as red as some of the other states. So now if you look at more of a localized view of where ACOs are, you can see that it's not just you know, whether ACOs exist, but you're starting to see multiple ACOs in particular uh, geographies. This is ACOs by your hospital referral region. If you're familiar with that geographic boundary. The ACOs uh, here, you're starting to talk about multiple ACOs performing in particular markets, which means ACOs are going to have to start uh, competing against one another. And the ways ACOs would generally compete against one another would be you, know, you want to compete for a larger patient population. So a lot of that is how the primary care community is affiliated with the ACO. Uh, but you're also going to see ACOs start to compete for the providers that are a part of their ACO. And so you're going to see uh, ACOs courting higher quality, lower cost providers and starting to get more selective about who they let into the tent. Just some stats here to consider. Only 21% of the 306 hospital referral regions do not have an ACO. Uh, Boston and LA both have 19 ACOs apiece, which is just just sounds astonishing to me. There's that many in this, those particular markets. You're seeing more and more new ACOs that are what they call physician-led, and that may have some hospital or health system participation, but would generally either be majority owned by or governed by a physician group. And just wanted to stress here that. A lot of this is not uh, ACOs that are competing with one another that are hospital backed. You know, this could be um, a hospital ACO in the same market as a physician led ACO. Uh, and, and so there's, there's a new type of competition developing there um, that, that might be uh, new to some folks on this call. Hey, Chris, it's Brad. Um, be before we move on, we, we had one question pop up during that last um, piece, um, and someone had asked about the setup costs uh, for an ACO, kind of, kind of, which I think is probably a bigger picture than this, as in what are the setup costs for an ACO, but I think if you could hit like a couple of the high-level um, major consider cost considerations before, getting, before a system gets into the ACO uh, side of the world, that would help. Yeah. So this has been uh, a bit of a moving target for folks. Uh, I, I think uh, generally you get into seven figures pretty quickly, but the main uh, components of what you're looking at, uh, IT is often a big uh, startup cost. Uh, I think estimates there generally range from one to four million uh, for IT and for some folks. 
Um, but also keep in mind that doesn't necessarily have to be borne by the ACO um, itself. It can often be supported by a health system. Uh, you're seeing a lot of payers uh, offering. I know Aetna has a solution now for ACO development from an IT standpoint, more of a data-driven solution. Um, other would be care coordination staff. So there's a pretty good uh, staffing component there um, uh, as far as how you're uh, coordinating care among ACO participants um, and even coordinating care among non-ACO participants as well. So there's a bit of a staffing uh, need there. Uh, you also uh, need sort of a combination of those two categories, quality reporting systems and monitoring. You know, it's important to be able to, if you're not measuring it, you can't manage it. So you'll see a lot of folks that uh, will need to invest in some type of quality reporting structure uh, or staffing uh, or IT system as well. Uh, and, and then you'd also have just sort of general business expense of setting up an ACO. Um, whether that oftentimes uh, advisors or attorneys are brought in in the development process. There's uh, frequently compliance concerns uh, that you all are familiar with from a stark and anti-kickback standpoint, but a lot of times in, in, uh, on the Medicare side, there's some pretty nice uh, waiver programs available uh, that can significantly alleviate a lot of those concerns that we've seen been uh, used to great success. Uh, uh, in the past. Um, and, and so, you know, I think a couple million dollars has been sort of uh, batted around as kind of an initial and uh, 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 cost for starting up an ACO. Um, but you'll see the, depends on who's speaking, but you'll see the cost range pretty significantly from, you know, a couple million dollars to, you know, eight figures or more. Um, but in my experience, it's been more towards the couple million dollar level. So a couple considerations on how uh, folks that are involved in ACOs might approach uh, generating some of the shared savings. And if you think about a physician only ACO who could have opportunity uh, to generate savings, you'll often find that they gravitate towards reducing institutional or hospital care as a way to generate that savings because generating that savings does not necessarily come at their expense. So reducing hospital admissions uh, doesn't necessarily uh, lower uh, physician-only ACO's uh, fee-for-service reimbursement. Take that one step further, and if it's uh, uh, PCP-only ACOs, they may start to limit uh, referrals not only to institutional care, but also to the specialists as well. Uh, you'll see uh, this happen. And there are some pretty significant examples of this happening in Boston right now with some of the Blue Cross contracts, how a lot of the primary care physicians have really begun to change their referral patterns and steer patients away from specialist or higher cost hospital care um, as a result of uh, some uh, Blue Cross uh, contracts that have been implemented up there. And so what you start to see here is a tension that uh, builds, and it's the, the, the cost question with good timing because uh, because of the cost of developing an ACO, you often need access to capital to get things off the ground, which generally would include including someone like a hospital uh, because of the ability to, to help with the capital uh, startup cost uh, versus excluding someone like the hospital because uh, they uh, are often one of the highest costs of care on the care continuum. And, and so you see a bit of a tension starting to build there uh, between the, uh, the, the, the types of entities and individuals that could be part of, a, of an ACO. And because of that tension, you have to start thinking whether it's realistic to sort of stay on the outside of an ACO for the long term. Um, and, and whether or not you could not have any relationship with an ACO because uh, you would not want to be one of those folks that was on the outside uh, and then get cut out of uh, ACO shared savings payments and then to compound that problem be one of the folks that has reduced services that they're providing to those ACO patients uh, because of a, a quality or a cost issue. So a couple categories of opportunity for shared savings for ACOs. 
and we'll tick through these uh, pretty quick. These are three, we'll go through three charts here that are based on Medicare data uh, from last year uh, on, from the, the MedPAC group, which is the Payment Advisory Commission. And uh, th this is where you'll see uh, folks start to look for opportunities for savings uh, once they uh, develop their ACOs. And the first would be care setting. Uh, so where is the patient receiving the care? You know, historically, hospital inpatient care is uh, pretty significantly the highest uh, cost for patients of any care setting, which makes sense, of course, because of the acuity level. Uh, and so what you see for physician-led ACOs, like we mentioned, is those uh, focused on keeping patients out of the hospital. But for hospital-led CEOs, at the same time, you see uh, hospitals just focusing on managing those patients that are admitted in a better way, more cost-effective way, once they are admitted. So you can see where some of the focus might be. Of course, uh, the second line down is physician care uh, in, in this chart. And, and that leads to uh, the next chart. But before we go there, just wanted to highlight a couple that a couple recent transactions that um, I think, frankly, are a bit scary for hospital the hospital community. And that's this recent trend of payers, commercial payers, acquiring large physician practices. There was a physician practice, a couple physician practices in California recently that have been acquired by. Uh, United plan uh, and a Blue Cross or a WellPoint plan. Uh, but then you also have uh, DeVita who acquired Healthcare Partners, which is a large uh, multi-specialty group and Medicare Advantage plan in California uh, for $4.4 billion, so significant transactions. And uh, what I think is uh, a bit scary can be that the uh, as if payers and uh, physician groups are collaborating on the animal care style uh, contracts without a hospital uh, as a part of that discussion, um, you start to worry about steerage issues and you start to worry about uh, volume issues for hospitals as well. So it's sort of a, a double whammy on not being able to participate in shared savings and then losing uh, volumes uh, from the fee-for-service world. Second uh, sort of opportunity from an ACO standpoint of where savings could be generated it's that we're, if you look at this graph here, we're doing more services. We're providing more services per patient. So is there a way to limit the amount of services that we are providing for each patient that comes through our system? Uh, this graph here is the spending per beneficiary for Medicare patients based on the uh, physician uh, fee schedule. Uh, the uh, two bottom lines are more of sort of an index line. Those are the annual payment updates on the fee schedule. Uh, the top line is the spending per beneficiary, so you can see you're beating those index updates pretty significantly. And so you'll, I think you'll start to see uh, ACOs focus on uh, how to, why are we doing so many different things to a specific patient. Third area of opportunity would be the types of services that are ordered uh, by physicians. This graph here, if you start at the bottom, those two bottom lines are major procedures, so you know, things done in hospital facilities, and E&M billing. So if you just use the E&M billing as sort of an index here on uh, general growth of, uh, uh, of uh, physician uh, spending or productivity, and then you take a look at the top three lines, which are imaging, uh, tests or labs, and then you know other procedures or office-based procedures, that sort of thing, you can see that uh, there's been significant growth in some of those ancillary services. And if you, if you think about where, which types of care might start to be cut out to generate savings from an ACO, I think these will be the, the, the couple, the ancillaries will be one area that will be uh, addressed uh, right out of the gate by a lot of the ACOs. Fourth so just real quick, we was gonna touch briefly on the Medicare program ACO, and, and we have plenty of information to supplement this, but performing a Medicare ACO, there is a, a process to it, and it's not to be underestimated. It does take uh, some effort, um, uh, and in our experience, uh, is, uh, is people, and people will tend to underestimate the process of developing an ACO application. But generally, you need a legal entity 
uh, whether that's a new entity or an old entity or, or a, a, a something that's a joint venture, you would need a new entity to be the applicant. Or you would need, a, I'm sorry, excuse me, a legal entity to be the applicant. T some type of governance structure, some type of management structure, uh, and of course the uh, uh, you know, particular concern, the, the enough participants in the ACO, ACO providers, as they're called, to uh, allow for 500 or 5,000 beneficiaries. Uh, and that, that number is based on the uh, PCP billings on Medicare fee schedules, their Part B billings. Just some high level stats on Medicare ACOs right now, give you. Some context on how many have been implemented and accepted. There's 250 total. Uh, that covers about 4 million beneficiaries, which is a, a decent size. Uh, that would equate to about 10% of the Medicare beneficiaries in the fee for service program, so that's not including Medicare Advantage. About half of the Medicare ACOs are again physician led, half of them serve fewer than 10,000 beneficiaries. And uh, only about 3% of the physician ACOs, I'm sorry, excuse me, of the Medicare ACOs uh, chose that two-sided at-risk model. Uh, and so, uh, which makes sense that as we're starting down this path that the, the, the less risky one-sided model is, is the, the model of choice for most folks, the vast majority of folks. Uh, and also, 37% uh, of applicants in the last round were rejected. That was about 60 applicants total. So CMS is being somewhat selective about who they uh, let into the program. And I can provide this to, to Brad and, and Kelly, but we, we have some uh, a, a white paper that's a bit uh, more specific on some of these technical requirements that I can provide to them. They we're welcome to circulate to the group that could uh, address some of these more specific issues. But a couple high-level points on, on what really matters in, in, for the application process in trying to achieve uh, acceptance into the Medicare Shared Savings Program. These are some of the more qualitative factors that when you apply for a Medicare ACO, you are required to demonstrate that you have these uh, in place and that they are effective uh, and could be effective if you're accepted to the program. And what we've found in our experience is that a lot of the more corporate and uh, structural items and participatory items about the ACO are, are more easily developed than would be some of these softer or qualitative uh, factors of an ACO. Uh, and as you can see, these are things like uh, quality assurance, uh, evidence-based medicine, patient engagement, care coordination, you know, patient-centeredness, centeredness, again, more soft factors that you have to describe how your ACO is able to meet those uh, requirements and, and how you're going to be able to uh, uh, make sure and, and uh, improve upon various areas of, of uh, clinical excellence, as they oftentimes describe it, uh, to, to make sure we're not limiting care to beneficiaries that need it, similar types of concerns. So uh, switch gears slightly, one option that uh, we've seen a lot of folks explore at this point uh, is development of clinical integration type of relationships as a way to build networks that are sufficient to meet uh, both ACO type contract uh, requirements uh, and also uh, that are sufficient to produce higher quality, low cost care that uh, I think we all agree is going to be required of the provider community in the future, uh, and in turn be able to uh, uh, collectively act uh, and go out and contract for uh, certain types of uh, commercial payer contracts. So the, the general premise with clinical integration is that you're, it, it's a less uh, formal relationship from more of a legal or a contractual uh, standpoint, but it's more uh, focused on getting different providers together to be able to develop uh, various protocols and efficiencies in the way that they deliver care. And 
generally that falls into two categories of uh, uh, competencies that, that clinical integration requires, and that's being able to define and enforce standards of care. Uh, so develop care protocols, but then monitor compliance with those care protocols. Uh, and then secondly, be able to coordinate patient care among all the different uh, entities or physicians or providers that are uh, within that uh, uh, group of uh, folks that are clinically integrated. And sort of the best way I've heard clinical integration described is uh, that you want to develop a structure that uh, where your ophthalmologist would care whether or not you got a colonoscopy. And so you're not, the, the providers that are in the community, the clinically integrated uh, enterprise or community, uh, are collectively concerned about the performance of each other and whether or not they're, they're meeting the evidence-based guidelines, whether or not they're delivering care efficiently and the like. And as you can see, this final bullet point here on this slide, it's it really starts to become a crucial strategy for uh, population health management style structures. Uh, there's kind of that second stage after accountable care organizations. But it's also important for accountable care organization development too because it's a very cost effective way to develop uh, the network that's needed to support an accountable care organization or an enterprise that's focused on population health management because it's very, it's very uh, cost prohibitive and logistically difficult to get everyone under one roof, whether that's from a corporate standpoint or from an ACO standpoint, it's just often difficult to make sure that uh, everyone is, uh, is receiving a W-2 from the same location or everyone is uh, sort of a partner, uh, you know, has equity in some type of organization. So this is often a, an alternative approach that we've found folks uh, more interested in lately. Uh, I know we're coming up on our time here, so I'll, I'll sort of breeze through these pretty quickly, but uh, clinical in, clinically integrated network is sort of the, the function, uh, the functioning network uh, when you're trying to pursue clinical integration. And it, it, you can see here some of the uh, ways that it allows providers to participate and, and become part of the, uh, the clinical integration effort. And again, it's, it's a lean infrastructure to be able to support the types of accountable, accountable care uh, efforts. Uh, and at the end of the day, if it meets uh, those legal thresholds, you know, clinical integration that originated as a legal concept, if it's able to meet those legal thresholds, uh, those independent providers uh, are able to jointly negotiate with payers. And in fact, uh, just in the last week or so, we've seen uh, the FTC come out with another advisory opinion that's loosening some of those requirements uh, for independent providers to be able to collectively negotiate with payers and sort of created a second track of clinical integration uh, from, from what we're used to in the past. This is just more of a holistic view of clinical integration. We don't have to go through these, but here's some of the kind of core concepts of clinical integration. You can review that on your own later, but uh, what we often find are, is the most uh, uh, important part of developing these clinical integration networks is are these uh, factors here uh, about how to uh, make sure that the network is functioning how it should and uh, it's, it generally involves around uh, providing higher quality low cost care uh, in a way that you're able to measure it uh, and in a way that where people have shared governance where people have a say in what's going on uh, and then at the end of the day being able to reward everyone for those efforts. And some of the opportunities that presents, as we mentioned, if you're able to clinically integrate and you're uh, able to, uh, you know, contract, you're going to need some negotiation contract competency. You're uh, also able to uh, credential providers in a way and provide reviews and peer, you know, peer review type uh, structure. Uh, you can also have very sophisticated quality and cost reporting uh, methods and uh, in addition, able to manage some of those patient activities outside the care settings as well, medication reconciliation and that sort of thing. So just one last uh, note here on uh, timing. Uh, you know, annually the Medicare program has an application deadline in early September, uh, early September, uh, so it's important to start kind of at the beginning of the summer at least, at the latest, uh, if you're thinking about developing uh, an ACO application. Uh, private payers, sort of we're offering these on rolling basis 
uh, whether it's in the annual contract negotiations and the like. Uh, but also don't discount the employers, uh, especially post uh, insurance exchange and 2014 implementation. Uh, they're really starting to get active in this area and they can, uh, they can uh, be fairly aggressive in pushing some of these initiatives as well. So with that, uh, thanks again for the time. I'll stop there. And uh, Brad, if we have a couple minutes, looks like for questions. Sorry to be so late, but if anyone has any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, if anybody's got any questions, if you just either want to click the uh, the raise your hand button, and I'll be glad to um, unmute you, and you can ask your question directly, or just type it into the questions box, and um, I can ask it. Um, to Chris, while we give you guys a, a second or two for that, um, I just want to uh, let you know that um, we will have recording of this webinar um, up in the next couple of days um, on our website. It'll be on the same page you went to to uh, find the handouts, um, and I will send an email out uh, when that's available to everybody who attended, along with a link to go ahead and do our um, feedback survey, um, so that way we can keep getting better at providing these webinars and um, give Chris some, some feedback as well. Um, Cause I'm sure like all of us who speak um, wants that. Um, and that's, that's kind of it. Chris, I don't see anybody with uh, nobody's typed in a question or raised their hand here in the last 45 seconds. So I think you're probably off the hook for the rest of the day. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again for uh, the time everyone. And, uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to everybody who attended. Um, if you go out to the Tennessee HFMA webpage, tnhfma.org, um, we have got another webinar coming up, uh, I believe, next week um, in coordination with our other Region 5 uh, partner chapters. So go out there uh, for more information on that, and I will plug the TNHFMA Spring Institute as well, since I'm co-chairing that. Um, find out more information at thespringinstitute.org. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.